Hello, my friends, and welcome back to another Digital Fireside. My name is Mark Williams. I am your host, and it's so good to be back with you for this wonderful fireside all about goal setting. And especially as we're getting into the new year, hopefully things are starting to settle after the holidays and everything. But I, I'm so excited to talk with our speakers tonight about how we can make this year the best year ever. So before you get, we get to that, if you haven't yet, go to turtle.ly slash app and download the Our Turtle House app. It's a wonderful resource to help you come closer together with your family and closer to Christ in a fun, entertaining way. And there's so many wonderful resources from some of your favorite speakers like John, by the way, Hank Smith, Meg Johnson, Carmen Herbert, and so many more. So go check that out at turtle.link slash app. We also love hearing your feedback on these firesides and want to make sure that the firesides are relevant to you and the questions that you have and, and the things that you want to learn about. So go to turtle.link slash share and let us know your feedback because we are eager to make, we want to keep these firesides going and we want to make sure that they're relevant to you and, and, and uh, stay important to the, the topics that you want to hear about and the speakers that you want to hear from. So you can leave that feedback for us at turtle.link slash share. Like I said, tonight's fireside is all about goal setting and making 2023 the best year ever. I know that it's kind of interesting. So many people set New Year's resolutions. And I think I read a statistic that 68% of people who set a New Year's resolution at the beginning of the year have quit by February 1st. And if you look at people who quit by March 1st, it's like 95%. And we don't want that to be you. I know I don't want that to be me. So how do we how how do we make this year the best year ever and actually stick to our goals and the things that are important to us and, and improve our lives the way that is important to us? Well, I'm so excited to hear from our speakers tonight. They're going to share their thoughts and their perspectives. So let's bring them on, shall we? Our first speaker is back by popular demand. We love having her, her here with us. She's a popular motivational speaker known for inspiring others with her unique honesty, authenticity, and spirit. She's dedicated to her family, faith, and inspiring others and loves teaching others with speaking and writing. She's experienced healing from a major chronic illness and is the mother to two miracle children. And after the heartbreaking suicide of her 40-year-old sister, she's constantly working towards prevent prevention and loves talking about mental health. She loves with an open heart and feels passionate about sharing principles that will, will empower others to live life with more joy. She's a regular television and radio guest and hosts popular shows like Talk of Him in the Middle and her talks and books, I think she's got 13 books out now, have encouraged thousands of people all over the world and she loves growing older with her husband and aims to keep learning and loving. loving. Let's welcome back our dear friend, Gainalyn Condi. Gainalyn, so good to have you back. My sister from another mister, I guess that's how you say it. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're brother and sister from uh, the pre-existence. There you go. It there was good go. to have a final, finally re reunited after how many years do we live on the planet without knowing each other? And exactly. So I'm glad we know each other now. Exactly. And we've hung out a lot over the last 12 yeah. months. And it just, I love, one of these days we're going to get to meet in person. It's Yeah, just, I think I think that's a good uh, New Year's resolution goal for 2023. Is I think get so. Get something on the calendar in person. I agree. And I warning, agree. I don't know if you know this, I'm a hugger. So perfect. we haven't talked about that. We've talked about so many things, but <laughs> I, I like to preface that for Bring the non-huggers that they need to have like a warning. She's coming in for a hug. So, I love it. Bring it on. Bring yeah. it on. Well, so good to have you back, my friend. Good to be here. Well, welcome our next speaker who is a writer, speaker, photographer, and advocate, and works with at-risk youth and women struggling with addiction. She mentors young adults and speaks regularly at jails and institutions. Recently, she published her first book titled Living Louder, a, Com um, a Compassionate Journey Through Federal Prison. She spent four and a half years in prison and came to know how valuable she is to our Father in Heaven. She speaks openly about her mistakes and what it took to move past them. She's married to her husband, Chad, and they enjoy the simple things in life with their six children and four grandchildren. Let's welcome Portia Louder. Portia, so good to have you here, my friend. Thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. I've heard a little bit about your story and just it's so it's an honor to have you with us. So thank you so much again for being with us. Thanks for me. We'll welcome our final speaker of the evening, who is a life coach best known for her top rated podcast, Build are better than happy, which has over 18 million downloads. She specializes in personal development tools for members of the LDS church and also coaches other coaches on business building and refining their coaching skills. She lives in Spokane, Washington with her four kids, 
kids ages 7 to seven to 16, and her husband. She does all her holiday shopping online. Who doesn't? Has a Diet Coke drinking problem, she says. And she's not the only one, though. Remember a, a couple years back, I think it was Elder Uchtdorf said that he does too. <laughs> and loves speaking in church. And uh, maybe she's a little weird on that one, but uh, speaking to church can still be kind of fun, I think. But let's welcome our final speaker, Jody Moore. Jody, so good to have you here with us. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. And and I don't I don't uh, I don't know as much about Diet Coke. My dad always loved Diet Coke, but I feel you on the Diet Dr Pepper. You know, just yeah, it just. I mean. We got to get our caffeine somehow. Got to get it somewhere. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you so much all for being with us. Let's start with an opening prayer by Jody, and then we'll dive right into tonight's messages. All right. Our dear kind Father in heaven, we're so grateful for this opportunity that we have to gather together, um, together and virtually and to uh, learn of thee and to feel of thy spirit. We're so grateful for everyone who puts the time into producing this fireside. And we're grateful for the, the vulnerability and stories that are about to be shared. We ask that the spirit will be with us and that we'll, uh, those listening might be open to receiving answers to their struggles. We're grateful for our Savior, Jesus Christ, who makes all of this possible. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jody. Okay, let's start things off with Gaina Lynn. And just you, I love your perspective on so many things. I know we've talked on lots of previous firesides about the stewardships that we have, and you've got a fantastic book about stewardships. And, and I'm excited to hear your perspective on how we can take those stewardships that we have and, and take them into this new year to make this new year better, especially when life looks differently than we may expect it. It does. Well, I've been really grateful. I always love being on these Turtle House firesides and some people only know me from here. It's funny that <laughs> like in all the places I show up and share content, it's funny that there are certain people that only think this is what I do. This is the only thing that I do. And I love it. I, I'll take it. I'll take it. I love being here, but I, I would just say, I always love preparing for these firesides. I always love being with other great content creators but this one in particular was such a gift for me in preparation because God taught me things and he always teaches me, but it was really helpful to dive in the scriptures. So I'm excited to share what I found in, in creating um, a plan for this year and following dreams, but really partnering with God and doing that. And so thanks for the invitation. It's you blessed bet. me already. So I can, and I can, I can testify that that's true because I remember when we were talking last uh, like last January or February. And uh, I was saying that we were going to do something on having the courage to follow your dreams and, you know, new years and new beginnings. And from that moment, you're just like, I have to be on that one. Yeah, I have to be on that one. So, oh, uh, it's, well, it's I, awesome. I'm glad that you are okay when I force, force <laughs> myself upon you. <laughs> I love it. I, I, I got to hook up a sister, you know? So. That's right. That's right. I Thanks, well, Mark. Gainalyn, so good to have you with us. Go ahead Thank and take you. it away. Okay. I'm so grateful, as I've already shared, with the opportunity to prepare and ponder and dive into the scriptures. As an author, I every time I'm about to work on a book project, I go to the Lord and then I go to his books because he's the ultimate in the teachers of the world and the universe. And he always has put in his books what I feel like may be a new insight or a thought or a principle that I want to teach and present into the world. And so when this topic, as Mark just said, was kind of in the works and planning all year, I really wanted to make sure I shared with you what I felt like God was already saying about creating and having the courage to follow your dreams for this new year. So I'm going to give you scripture. And as usual, I'm going to try to share some application but that's really just an invitation for you to have a jumping off point so that you can have your own personal revelatory conversation with God this year. I think first and foremost, it's really important as you are thinking about this new year and maybe reflecting on last year, what did you learn about yourself? What did you wrestle with? What were some of the difficult stewardships and what were some of the maybe more joyful, easier ones to lean into? I think this year, as we always feel maybe at the beginning of a new year, 
this like freshness, this hope we're, we're hopefully more rested after a holiday break and there's optimism. But as we talked about in the chat, uh, you know, it's easy to get to February and March and already feel like maybe life has thrown some curveballs and maybe some of the unexpected stewardships that you hadn't planned on. I think the last few years, for sure, as a global family, we can relate to the unexpected. We've all been asked to step into the unexpected stewardships of a pandemic, of wars, of um, maybe illness, of economic uncertainty. And so I, I think first and foremost, I want to validate that the unknown stewardships that we don't even know yet are coming can maybe make us feel as if our plans and our goals and our dreams in January of a year are off track within a few weeks. But I want to start first and foremost, if you're taking notes, I'm a note taker. I really believe in the power of of writing things out because I feel like that's also a, a tool in which God reveals himself to me. So if you're a note taker, great. If not, it's okay. Um, I hope your heart will take notes of the principles that I want to share. First and foremost, this truth is where I think we need to keep returning. Uh, I have uh, two kids and I have a daughter that is preparing for um, um, a mission. And I've talked to her as she has wrestled to make the decision to serve. And she wrestled for a long time to try to get a confirmation that she was supposed to serve. And when she had that revelation, um, it was so clear. And for all the rest of us that love her and know her, it felt very obvious that she would serve. And she said to me jokingly, mom, did everybody know before I knew? And I said, it's important that you wrestle to know because you have to return to your why when things get tough, whether it's marriage, missions, parenting, all the good stuff is the hard stuff. And we have to know our why. And so this is the why that I want you to be able to return to this year as things pop up and they will just assume that they will. There will be times where you're going to have unexpected gifts show up and you're going to have unexpected challenges. Go back to this truth and this why that God desires good for us. He really does. That is the truth. And when we know that truth and when we can return to that truth, especially when the storm is swirling around us, it can reground us into these dreams, these plans, these goals and these hopes. So I'm going to share scripture with you because I really believe in the power of the truth of a sword and the truth sword that we talk about when we put, talk about putting on the whole armor of God are his scriptures, his words. And when we can quote him, when the distortion is there, when it gets really foggy in our heart, in our minds and in our lives, then we can slay through the distortion. So the first scripture reference that I want to share with you about this idea, this principle that God desires good for us is Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declared, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Isn't that beautiful? God has plans for us. So as we're making plans for this new year, realize God has plans for us. And maybe sometimes when the difficult stewardships show up, it's easy to feel like his plans for us aren't exciting. They aren't good. They aren't fun. The plans for our neighbor includes Hawaii trips and new cars and kids going to Harvard and all the, all the dreams and hopes seem to be checking off boxes on their goal list for the new year. While over on our side of the street, we're, we're dealing with unexpected things that don't make us feel as if the plans God has for us are true, joyful, and happy stewardships. But what I want to, to reiterate is that Jeremiah 29 teaches us that the plans God has for us always are to prosper us. Now, I've talked on Turtle House before about stewardships. I talk about it on my show, Talk of Him. I, I wrote a book last year about this. So I don't want to do a too deep of a dive. But the truth is, the truth sword that you can use to slay, slay through all the distortion when things get tough is that the stewardships, the hard ones even, are a gift, that they are plans to prosper you. And when you go into distortion, you can slay through. Like I shared with my daughter, there's 20% there's of the magic on a mission, but as a missionary, and maybe you have a full-time missionary serving right now that you can share this with, there's that 80% of maybe not awesome, maybe not magic. 
So as you are setting down maybe on a list, in a journal, on a calendar, goals or dreams for this year, start from the beginning. The beginning truth is this. God has a plan to prosper you. He wants good things for you. He desires good things for you. So when it doesn't look like that's what's playing out, go back to that truth. Even repeating this scripture will be like a sword that slays through. I, I don't know about you, but I have to return to the truth because I can start out morning holy habits. I'm really grounded. I'm paired with heaven. I'm connected with my goals and my dreams for the day. And by two o'clock that afternoon, there's been a number of derailments or un, unplanned um, surprises. And I have to go back to where I started. That anchor of truth in the scriptures is so powerful. The next principle I want to share with you is what I talk a lot about in stewarding, and that is making offerings and not being so outcome focused. Now, I know we live in a world where there's barometers, there's measurables, there's tracking, there's algorithms, there's expense and profit reports. And I get that from a business standpoint, even from a church standpoint, we look at records, we keep records, we, we have charts, we have proposals that need results. But I believe in the economy of God, that he functions in an offering economy, not so much hyper-focused or myopically as President Nelson teaches in the outcome. So where's the scripture truth in this? Matthew 6, 33. And there's a million that I could share with you because when I worked on the stewardship principle, I really did try to create a library of stewardship scriptures. And so there's a lot that, that reminds me that God wants me to focus on the offering and leave the outcome to him. But Matthew 6, 33 says, but seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So when we focus on the scriptures of truth, and then we realize that God wants us to first seek him, that if we do everything from building a business to working on our health, to raising a family, to building a blog, to putting in a garden this summer, taking care of our pet, uh, fixing a car that keeps breaking down, which would be our family's story the last few months, that God, if we can do things out of love for him, then that offering is consecrated. I love the idea that when we're writing, when we're doing a business, when we're raising kids, when we're working maybe out on social media, whatever we're doing, if we make the why about love for God, then that offering will be consecrated. I think one of the biggest traps for me that pulls me into the ownership mindset and out of stewardship, really hyper-focused on outcomes and at times discouraged is comparisons. And I love social media because I can connect with you there. I can keep having a conversation with you way after this fireside is over. But I also believe that it can be a place where there are comparison traps at every swipe and every scroll. And if we're not careful, it looks like our, our friend and, and whoever we're looking at on social media, their offerings are multiplying and their outcomes are coming out like the perfect cake. I am not a baker, but I have a neighbor that's really great at baking. She's really great at making jewelry. She's really great at doing art. If she loves something, she goes figures out how to do it on her own. And she creates uh, in this beautiful, effortless way. I write about her in the stewardship principle. I was having a heart-to-heart -heart mom conversation with her the other day. She's a, a mom of a young group and, and, and a teenage group. And I currently am the mom of adult children that are, are somewhat out of the house. They're in college, but they, they boomerang home for Sunday dinners and to do their laundry. And we're having a conversation, a perspective about this offering approach to our goals and our dreams. And I was sharing with her a really difficult time parenting for me with my son. And my kids um, have, have had their story shared publicly in books and, and in talks that I've given. And so they understand that some of who they are is out there in the world. And so I was sharing with her my perspective back then that all these efforts, especially as a parent, feel at times like you're pouring yourself into your children and the goals and dreams and, and offerings that we're making is really like a marathon and not a sprint. 
And then they grow up and they move out and they move forward and they wrestle with their own value system and they decide their own course forward and they take your offering. And sometimes kids can set those offerings aside. And so I was talking with her as she was expressing concern and worry about one of her children. And we cried together, you know, as moms do when we're tired. And I didn't have any magic answer for her, but I encouraged her to keep making the offerings. We don't have control of the outcome. And I know that may sound counterintuitive to a goal setting fireside, a dream focused fireside. But the reality is all we have is our offering. We see in the scriptures that God is asking for our broken hearts and our contrite spirit, because really that's what we have to give. And yet, if we become too outcome focused, we want to sometimes hold back on the offering, whether it's with a child, with a, with a health issue, whether with our finances or a dream that we feel like has been unfulfilled. It's easy to give up when the offerings don't equal the outcome that we thought God had shown us. I think especially with parenting, with those stewardships that are really eternal and sacred, it's so crucial to not go into comparisons. We have no idea what's happening behind the closed doors of our neighbor, of our ward members, of our friends, of our extended family. And so it's easy to think that somehow they have the perfect recipe formula because look at how their cakes turned out. And yet our cake keeps falling in the middle or our child is struggling with addiction or our child is dealing with a learning disability. Whatever your stewardships are, I hope you will continue to make the offering this year. Once you have gone to God and sought his will for you and he has put on your heart a prompting or a dream, trust in that. Trust that your goals are his goals. Your plans are his plans. And he wants to prosper you, as I've already shared. So first, remember, he desires good for you. Two, make the offering. And then three, trust in his plan for you. Proverbs 63 talks about committing to the Lord whatever you have to establish your plans. That means not giving up. It means consistently making the offerings each day. This last year, 2022, had some of the biggest highs and some of the hardest lows for me. Um, it's tender to me that the prophet has asked us to seek and expect miracles. But I have been tutored about the law of opposition in ways I never had experienced before this past year. When the prophet of God is excited about us focusing on miracles, I hope you understand that means that the law of opposition is at play. For as great as the miracles will be and have been for me in this last year, the opposite of that, the law of opposition, is the extreme opposition and frustration and disappointment that also played out. I'm so grateful that at the end of 2022, I sat there in awe of the miracles God had orchestrated. But I will be really transparent. By July, August of last year, I was pretty sure some really important projects in my life were coming to an end. And I was discouraged and sad. I had put everything on the altar. I had, I had invested and fought and made the offering over and over again, trusting that the outcome would be in God's hands. But it was pretty clear by around August that uh, things weren't working and things weren't going to continue. And then without getting into too much detail, because we have two amazing gifted speakers that I want to make sure have time to share with you their thoughts, um, some miracles happen and then some opposition. It was like 11th hour miracles and then 11th hour opposition. And it was, it was like a domino. It was like, I don't know how the story is going to play out. And I'm here to say to you that this year coming up, expect and seek miracles. Trust God's plan for you. Just because the opposition shows up that day in intense disappointment, discouragement, or even loss, understand that your capacity to receive even greater miracles are coming. And that's the pattern of God. That's his pattern. That's his law that he lives by. I can testify in the next principle that I can do hard things with God. That was my very first book, 13 books ago in Philippians 4, 13 talks about doing everything through God's strength, not on my own. 
And I will say that in losing my sister Meg, which I've talked really publicly about and written about to suicide, that that grief was unlike any other grief. But on the opposite side of that coin, there has been joy and miracles and connection with many of you because of her story that wouldn't have happened any other way. And I trust in my mighty God. My God and your God has created universes. So whatever's hard in front of you right now, with him, it is possible. And then I'm going to share with you my final two thoughts. Knowing God desires good for you, knowing that offering is his economy and not so focused on outcomes, trusting in his plan for you, knowing that you can do the hard things with him. I'm going to invite you to write down your dreams. I know that can be scary. I actually have a dream journal upstairs right now that is waiting for me to sit down and encourage and in faith and in hope, write down, draw out, Google whatever you need to, to get your wheels turning, start drawing pictures or journaling or, or expressing through that creative process of writing. What is on your heart? Trusting that God wants what's good for you. Habakkuk 2.2 says, Then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it, a pl it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. And I believe that angels are running with your dreams. I, I believe in the power of writing things down. That, that together with God we create. And when he puts something on your heart and you take this step forward to act on it, you make the offering, trusting that he has good in store for you. Being in an offering mindset and then writing it down is an action of faith. Finally, I want you to know that I believe in the power of praise. Praise doesn't mean this is awesome and happy and I want this to go on forever. But praise unlocks the power of heaven. In Philippians 4, 6, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. I think Nephi teaches this principle beautifully as he's tied up on a ship. He's not happy about it. It's not Disneyland and he is praising God. And then we see that the Liahona works as he is untied. The power of praise works. In all that we do, we can praise. It says to God, I see you. I have eyes on Jesus in this situation. I believe in praising when you're trying to find a parking spot. Praising when your child has struggled with drug addiction. Praising when maybe you're dealing with a divorce. When we praise God, we say to God, I see you in this situation. I know you desire good for me. I'm going to keep making the offering. I'm going to trust in your plans for me because I know I can do hard things with you. I'm going to write down my dreams. I'm going to journal each night. I'm going to express gratitude when I go to bed for the simplest thing like a tube of toothpaste paste or a great new pillow that you finally found on the internet that doesn't hurt your neck anymore. That is actually a truth of my 2022 uh, miracle list. I hope and pray this year that you will dream big, that you will trust in God, that you will do your stewardships with him. Keep making the offerings. He is there when the storm is swirling. Right in the center of those storms are peace. The peace beyond understanding. When you partner with him, and you trust in him, beautiful miracles are coming. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Gandalin, I love that. And I loved how you talked, especially about how God desires good for us. I, that was a huge mindset shift for me a few years back where I, I don't know where I picked up this false belief, but just where, you know, God picks winners and losers. And if things aren't going right, then that's, you know, it's what it's God's plan for you. And I think that that is really short sighted. And I love that you talked about that because he really, if, if he, if he is our loving heavenly father, which I believe he is, then he would want good for us. He wants us to, to work hard and things are not going to be perfect because we live in the world, but that he wants us to, to be good. He wants us to find happiness. He wants us to return to live with him again. So thank you so much. That was, yeah. That did, you, home. did you feel that distortion just get sliced just by you <laughs> restating it? I could feel it again. Like you have to just keep repeating the true swords because the distortion and fog creeps in. And then that testifying you just did, I felt it again. It's true. He does want good for me and you. I love that.
Gaina Lynn, I also wanted to comment. I love when you talk about, um, and, and thank you for sharing just openly about having struggled this year. Um, and when you talked about it being the 11th hour and that challenges and miracles happen, it reminds me of, um, I always have to remind myself of this. In the scriptures, the Lord says, on the fourth watch, he mm -hmm. comes, right? And that Hebrew night is di was divided into four watches, and the last watch wasn't until um, like six in the morning or something. And so all night long, he lets us tarry and toil and he comes on the fourth watch. And I always want to say, why can't you just come like on, on the second watch or the beginning of the third watch? <laughs> but um, but uh, for whatever reason, part of the, the toil is also part of the good that God wants for us. And um, anyway, I, I appreciate you just opening up and sharing that even for somebody that seems so positive and has it all together like you, that, that we all struggle. We all struggle. <laughs> oh, man. I, I think if I could write a book about 2022, maybe one day I will. All the backstory. And I try to be pretty transparent on social media and out there in the world. But yeah, I, I love that, Jody. Like, I have to remember the pattern of God is he is a fourth watch God mm -hmm. all the time, you know? And yeah. it's because that's when he is helping me become like him, which ultimately means I get everything that he has. But that that curriculum is intense for sure. <laughs> I yeah. love that you said be grateful for the hard because there's so much growth in that. And of course, when I'm going through the hard, it's like, this is so hard. I can't do this. And then I see looking back how yeah. I've been refined and grown through the, through the hard. And I liked that you talked about, it's not outcome based. We, yeah. we make the next right choice with our, our God in connection with him, our father in heaven. And then we let him decide the outcome because he has a more beautiful plan than we do. And you are such a great example of that, my friend. So thank you for that feedback. I appreciate it. I love it. Well, Gaina Lynn, thank you so much again for being with us and such a powerful message tonight that you've shared tonight. Thank you so much. We'll move to our next speaker of the evening, Portia. It's so good to have you here on the fireside and to get to know you a little bit better. And and I've heard a little bit about your story, but I'll let you uh, let you dive into it and share share it with everybody. So go ahead and take it away, my friend. Thank you so much. Well, I'm honored to be with you, um, a little bit nervous, and I, I've done this a time or two, but I feel a little bit nervous. Um, I want to talk about making space for dreams and goals, and I'm going to talk about that um, in a personal way for me, which is through repentance, and um, because I have felt my soul open up through repentance, and I feel like there's, um, there's more room. There's more room for those goals and dreams. So I'm going to share that. Um, two different times in my life where I've experienced that. So I am native to Utah. I grew up in a small town. I'm the oldest of seven children and was raised in a LDS home, but we did not um, read scriptures and pray together. We were pretty, I mean, I know homes come in all different ways, but my parents are very creative. So structure wasn't our thing. And at an early age, I started struggling. I struggled from 13 on. I just said, I am not going to church. And in our home, you kind of did what you wanted to do. So that was that. And if I had one thing that I could look back on my life and say, it was like, I did not know who I was. You know, I didn't know who I was to our Heavenly Father. And I, I really struggled with relationships. I thought that what boys thought of me was the most important thing. And, you know, that's something that I, when I look at my mom, if I could give her, it would be for her to know how amazing she is. Because I feel like as a woman and as a mother, that is, we can't give something to our children that we don't personally know. And so I've come to, to see how important it is for me to keep that direct connection. More important than anything else, as much as I love my husband and my children, number one for me is between me and my Heavenly Father. And by the time I was 17, not going to church, um, I was pregnant with my first child. And, and I remember feeling, um, I guess you could say pretty hopeless. I moved out, lived into a low income apartment at that point in time and still didn't think that it was about me and God. I just thought I needed to find the right person to get married and settle down. And, and so that led me into another relationship. I ended up pregnant again. Um, married and and about that time my parents moved to Salt Lake 
my marriage wasn't going well. And again, um, we decided to divorce and I moved up with my parents. And so I have two children. I'm a single mom. I remember being pretty sad and my dad telling me, you should try to read the Book of Mormon. And I said, well, I just don't even think that's true. And he said, you know, you're smarter than that. You've never read it. Why don't you try reading it? <laughs> so, and my dad challenging me, you know, and I, I started to read the Book of Mormon and I felt this comfort and peace. I wasn't going to church. I was working at the time as a photographer, but I started to see that there was a little bit more. And I remember going um, to the church after my little girl was born and my dad blessed her. And I was sitting in the, the room where other mothers were nursing their children. And I thought, how do I get from where I am to where they are? Like, I, again, I just thought that I needed to find the right relationship. Again, not knowing again that it was about me and my heavenly father. And I got in another relationship. And for me, I know that infertility is a problem for some, but for me, I get pregnant. That's just what happens. <laughs> like, so I have six children and, and it just happens for me. So I got pregnant again. And, and I remember being scared because I thought I'm not taking care of the children I have. I'm not, you know, I didn't have any child support or relationship with their fathers. And so I got on my knees and I prayed and I said, the first real prayer I had ever said, which was, Heavenly Father, I don't know what to do. I'm scared. Please help me. And I felt this comfort and warmth come over me. And I knew that I was having this child was special. And I knew that Heavenly Father wanted me to find his family and that I would be giving him up for adoption. And I, and I remember talking to my, my parents and my dad said, you're strong. I, I know you can do this. And my mom said, it would be too hard. I don't think you can do this. And, but I had been given that, that answer in prayer. And so I started down that journey and, and it was beautiful. I met an amazing family and we, we connected. They weren't just there for my son. They were there for me. And as soon as I had him, I felt completely empty inside. I didn't get any counseling. I didn't really know anything about trauma or how to deal with my feelings. I just thought, well, I'll just keep powering through. And I ended up addicted to prescription drugs. And so I'm about 25, 26 years old and my life has gone pretty rough. So I'm not dreaming about anything. I am just thinking, I'm not setting goals. I'm just trying to survive at that point. And um, I had an experience where I came home late one night and my son, my oldest son, my mom was taking care of my kids. I had lost my job, so I was pretty low. And my mom said, I don't know what would ever want, what would, bring you to change your life. Like, what is it, Portia? What could it possibly be? And because this little boy loves you, these kids love you. And if this isn't enough for you, whatever would be. And I walked downstairs that night and I sat on my knees and I begged God. I said, I will give up everything. I won't ever date another man. <laughs> I'll give up anything you want me to. I can't do this on my own. I need help. And so the next day I walked across the street to our bishop, my parents' bishop, I didn't know him. I hadn't been to church. And I said, I knocked on his door and I said, please help me. I need help. <laughs> and, and he said, oh, I'm going to help you, but I need to get some other people involved. <laughs> so he had somebody come and take me to um, a 12 step meeting. And he worked with me and helped me through that repentance process. And I remember him saying, Portia, you might be the most selfish person I've ever met. <laughs> which seems so horrible. Nowadays, a bishop would be kicked out for doing that. But honestly, I'm so grateful that he was able to help me and he spoke truth to me. And he told me that if he promised me, he said, I promise you with priesthood, power and authority, if you go to church, if you read your scriptures and you say your prayers, your whole life will change. And I needed a whole life change. I was desperate. And so we started down the repentance process together. I remember calling him at work and I said, I figured it out. I know why I did all the things I did. And he said, why? And I said, because I wanted to. And he said, oh, Portia, that's beautiful. Because I had been blaming my mom and my circumstances and my ex-husband, and it was everyone else's fault but my own. But as soon as I took ownership, I had power in my life. And I continued on that journey, and I felt uncomfortable because it is hard to come back to church when you haven't been there. I just didn't feel comfortable, but people were kind to me and I was determined. And I remember being six months down this path and taking my son on a field trip and going, wow, 
I'm being a good mom. <laughs> it was just like epic for me because, you know, and, and that's the beauty of repentance, those beautiful little treasures that come. And so, you know, what happens when you, when you start down that journey is that it's hard and it becomes amazing because that's what repentance is. And I met my husband, which I wasn't looking for him at all. And, and we got married and we went to the temple and my husband adopted or my two children. And, and I was grateful every day for what God had given me. And, and it grew, you know, I had a desire to start my own photography company. It just went boom, boom, boom. I went from 20, 30 weddings a year to 200 weddings a year with employees. And, and I forgot um, those basic things that the bishop had promised me. I wasn't reading my scriptures daily. I was going way too fast. And after our, and two kids close together again, because that, that's something that just happens for me. So we had Jackson and Sadie, and after I had Sadie, I had a back surgery and I relapsed. And and I didn't get honest with me myself, you know, and I ended up getting involved in these illegal real estate deals, which took me to prison. And I remember walking into a courtroom and feeling just as as low. I mean, it was the most the most sorrowful place I've ever been, because the the reality of of the choices that I had made and what I had done was so real for me that day. And I look back at my husband and my children and I said a prayer and I asked for strength. And then I stood up and I apologized and the judge sentenced me. And I knew that day that I would be going to prison for a long time. I would, I ended up being gone for four and a half years. And my little, my youngest daughter was seven years old at that point in time. And the only thing that I knew was that I was going to get through it. That's it. I didn't know how, because there was a strength above my own that was holding me that day. And so I did. I said goodbye to my husband and my children. And I walked into a, a prison in Dublin, California, and just completely devastating. And after three days of not wanting to leave the cell and being so lost and so broken, I got on my knees and I said the most important prayer I've ever said in my entire life, which was, Heavenly Father, I feel like nobody to anybody. I am in the deepest hole. I have failed my family, my community. I have failed you. Nobody knows my name. I'm not a mother. I'm not a wife. Nobody cares for me here. I need to know who I am to you. And I felt this incredible amount of love. I felt so much love coming to that room, kneeling by myself, a nobody. God knew me and he loved me in a way I had never experienced. So much love that I thought I never needed a man. <laughs> I mean, I love my husband, but clearly... Who we are to our Heavenly Father is, oh, and not just me, but that's, that's how he feels about everybody else. I could see that we all had this important purpose on this earth, and the value is in, impossible to describe. And because of that experience, I knew that I was going to get through four and a half years of prison. Now, I, I didn't know how hard it would be. It's impossible to know that. I mean, I took it step at a time. And there were times that I thought, I can't do this. It's going to break me. And I, I had to get back on my knees over and over again in prayer. Hours and hours I spent in prayer. And I had a lot of repenting to do. One of the good choices that I made was I went to my bishop and my state president. And they helped me get through that. So that when I went to prison, I had support. I had the support of my community, our ward. And I was even able to take my garments, which was a huge blessing. I mean, I... I I mean, I was so grateful for that. So I started the repentance process. And I can testify that when we do our part, the gospel, our Heavenly Father, and the leaders in the church are right there with you. And it's powerful to have that support. So I continued to walk through each hard thing like Gina Lynn shared. You know, um, I wasn't grateful for the hard at the time. There were times that I thought, I just need to get out early and I would do everything I could to try to get home. A couple of things happened. One was when I made the choice to do everything I could in the circumstances that I was in to be a good mother, to be a good person, to focus on what the Lord wanted me to do right there, right then. It changed things. It really opened things up for me. I started to focus on who I could be, the kind of servant that I could be what my stewardship was in the situation that I was in. So that was an eye opener for me. But even bigger for me was this. I was in a therapy class with about 70 women and a woman walked in 
And she, she read a list of everything she'd ever done to hurt anyone. And it was categorized and it was things that I had, that would be really hard to say out loud. And she was so brave. Like you could literally feel the power in the room when she did that. And afterward, the therapist asked her, she said, I just have one question. I just want to know what would make you care so much about your future that you would stand here to be, today and be so completely honest. And she looked at her and she said, because I've tried everything else to change my life except being honest. And today I'm going to be honest and it's going to work or I'm going to die. I can't do it anymore. And, and when I heard that, I knew that there was power in me owning my life in complete ownership. And so I made a list and I had the time to do it and it was extensive. It was like a, probably it was a spreadsheet and it took me almost six months to write out my life and how I had hurt others and, and be able to look at it from a different view. I actually started having compassion for myself as a young girl. And when I made that list and I shared it with some girls in the rec yard, I asked them to come down with me and I shared it and then I buried it. And I, I mean, and this, this was stuff that I didn't necessarily need to share with the bishop. It was just everything that I had gone through so that I could be reflective of, of where I was and what I wanted to change. And when I did that, my soul opened up. I started dreaming again about my future. I made a list of things that I wanted to change in myself. One of them was I wanted to become a good listener and a good friend. I made my goal list. I wrote a mission statement. And so for me, what preceded those goals and dreams and the visualizations of what I wanted my life to be was to open my soul through repentance. And that changed it for me. I started having hope and looking forward to something new again. My last, the last part of my sentence was so beautiful because I was able to connect wholeheartedly with people whose lives were so much more difficult than mine. The connection I felt to our Heavenly Father was so pure and real. I was almost like concerned. I was concerned. I was nervous to come home because I found something so beautiful. I enjoyed the connection because there was no social media and I would just sit in the sun and feel so much joy. And so when I came home, because that day came where my husband was sitting outside with a bouquet of flowers, which was so cool, and I got in the car and I was completely overwhelmed, what I knew was that everything important was inside of me, that there was no worldly accomplishment, money, things, what other people think of me was not going to rule my life anymore, that who I was to our Heavenly Father was what I was on this earth to know and to see that in others as well. And so I just, I just want to testify that that has been such a beautiful piece of my life, that I have found freedom and the space to rewrite my life through repentance. I know that, that that comes through the atonement of Jesus Christ. I know that no matter where you are on that path, when you turn to him, it changes everything. And the, the life that I have today is so beautiful. I could not have imagined a life this beautiful when I was standing in that courtroom. I could not have imagined when I was a single mom in a low income apartment, what Heavenly Father had in plan for me. And none of us can imagine the beauty of the life that he has in store for us. So I'm grateful for this opportunity to just share a little bit about my life and how those goals and things have come into fruition. It's come through repentance and ownership. It's come through opening my soul to our Heavenly Father and his plan for me. And I just want to share that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Portia, I love that, especially how you talked about as you're rewriting your life. Your first of all, your story is so powerful. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. And and I love how you talked about as you're rewriting your life, for you, you got to the place where after coming out of prison, that you your main focus was Heavenly Father's opinion of you. It didn't matter what people said on social media or what other people thought as you're recreating something new. And uh, that really stood out to me because I feel like, at least for myself, as, as I try to go after new things or become a new person or take on new identities and, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, starting a new aspect of a business or, or learning a new skill, those are all new identities. And I've, it's really easy to worry about, well, what, what are people going to say when I, post on social media that this is the new thing I'm working on, or this is the goal that I'm going after, or, you know, and I love how at the end of the day, it, that it doesn't matter. As long as you're good with heavenly father, that that's all the, it, everything else is just gravy, you know, what they say or don't say. 
And, uh, and so that's definitely been a reframe for me. So th as you've been talking, so thank you so much. I really appreciated that. Thank you. Portia, I, this is my first time um, meeting you and hearing your story and, um, and I'm just already in love with you. So thank you so much. Like, how can you not love you? Um, what a powerful story and amazing experience. And, and just, I can feel the genuineness of your spirit. Um, I do want to say, I, I love so much, you know, it's, it's my work as a life coach to help try to empower people through taking responsibility, through taking ownership. And, um, and you don't have to have um, something like, like a court date and, a, and an addiction for that to be useful and necessary. All of us have, have weaknesses and challenges and mistakes that we've made. I want to also just um, emphasize what you said so beautifully, which is that you have to take responsibility. You have to own, I've made choices. I've made mistakes with compassion and love without, as soon as we move into judgment and shame and start, um, berating ourselves. That's what the adversary wants us to do. The Lord wants us to take ownership and know that we are still loved and we are just as worthy and valuable. And I, I, your story is just such a powerful example of that. So many thanks for sharing it. Thank Portia, you. I'm, I felt like the whole time I was just rejoicing that whoever is listening, including myself, um, that may be caught in the secrets of their lives, but they're still trying to like jump to let's make goals this year and dreams that you gave full permission and showed the how. I think sometimes in the gospel, especially we talk about these ethereal concepts of faith and repentance and love and, and, and we don't show the how. And so I always say that, you know, Satan loves secrets and, I love that you showed the how of deconstructing that so that you really could, you know, um, move forward in this stewardship. And I talk about in the stewardship book, not going into ownership. So I'm not trying to counteract what anyone has said, but I, I like to reframe it that when we're intentional in our stewardship, we are not saying it's not my fault or I'm not, I'm not, staying present in this experience or I'm not taking responsibility. But if you had really like completely taken ownership, then I think sometimes it becomes all of who we are. And I love that you showed that in the truth and in coming to truth, you actually saw who you really were through God. And it's in the avoidance that the illness shows up. Right. And so I love, I love that you showed the how, so that everyone that listens can can start maybe this year with like, what is the secret that I need to walk through and expose and stay in stewardship about? That it's not all of who I am. Like all of who you are is not someone in prison, but who you are is beautiful because you went to prison. Like <laughs> it's that magical uh, a formula that only God can do, right? Like the beautiful part of you are the things that probably threaten to destroy you. And sorry, I could go on and on just because I think we, sh we, with such sacred work to show people our stories. And when we do it, it gives permission for God to meet us in our story and say, this is the way through and stop avoiding and hiding in that secret. And they make us sick. They just do. And we all have them. Right. Maybe it's not, you know, a court case that that it is brought to Jesus. But thank you for showing the how. Thank you. I love that, Portia. Thank you so much again for being with us and sharing such a powerful witness in your personal story. It's just been so wonderful to be with you tonight. Thank you. We'll move to our final speaker of the evening. Jody, so good to have you with us. Excited to, to learn more about your perspective. Uh, especially with your professional background as a life coach. I'm excited to, to hear the thoughts that you have to share with us today. So go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much. I am very excited. I love talking about this topic. Um, I want to tell everyone, remind everyone, I should say, of something that you probably already know about the human brain, about human beings in general, that we have this very strong and very important necessary part of our brains that our heavenly parents gave us that is wired to make sure we stay alive, right? Survival is the 
the first and most critical function of the brain. And we have parents who want to make sure that we stay alive too, right? As a, as a parent myself with uh, my oldest child is a, is a junior in high school this year. So he has one more year, year until he leaves the house. And I find myself thinking, oh, have I taught him? Like, I, I'm sure I've not taught him at all the things I need to be teaching him. I, what do I, what am I missing here? And I want to teach him about um, Jesus Christ and about the gospel. And I want to teach him about what I believe about health and about well-being. And I want to teach him all of that, but none of that is going to matter if I don't teach him how to survive. If he doesn't know how to make a grilled cheese sandwich, he's going to starve. And so survival is the, the primitive level of the brain. And so I will just say that everybody listening to this fireside tonight is surviving just fine. Maybe you're, maybe you're going through something challenging and you feel like you're just barely surviving. We all go through stages like that, but I promise you that if you have the technology to be able to stream a fireside like this or to watch it later, however you're watching this, um, you're doing well, you're actually far above survival. Okay. And this is important to know because I get the privilege of talking to you about having the courage to follow your dreams. And here's the truth. Dreams are beyond survival. Typically, right? Usually we want to survive and we'd like it to be as easy as possible. We want to have food and shelter and and enough money to get by. Those are all survival things, right? But we, we have dreams that are things that are just kind of alluring that sound interesting and fun. And uh, that survival part of your brain resists that. That part of your brain says, why are we going to do that? Why try this new scary thing when it might jeopardize our survival? We're already surviving so well. Why bother trying something new and something different? Let's just keep doing what we're already doing. Okay. And so before I answer the question about why I think we should pursue our dreams, I want to tell you why what are reasons that a lot of, that I used to believe and a lot of people believe that I think are not the reasons. Okay. So sometimes we think I will be happier or I will be a better version of me in some way. I will earn my worth or something, or, or just be happier once I achieve this thing, whatever your dream is, maybe your dream is, is to, um, to start a business or to, um, to start a podcast or to write a book or to, to be a dancer or a singer, an athlete or whatever, okay, whatever your dream is, part of you might think I'll be happier and just more worthy. That is not true, my friends. I hate to tell you this, but happiness, we, d- we just heard a great example of this from Portia. How could she get to such pure joy when she was still in prison? Because happiness happens internally. So achieving things doesn't ultimately create happiness. Maybe temporarily you will find some better feelings and thoughts, but in the long run, you're always going to be a human being who has to choose happiness, who sometimes will and sometimes won't. And that's okay. And you're already worthy, right? Um, It's also, I don't find it useful anyway to pursue a dream thinking my life will just be easier and better. Now, There are certain amounts of money that make life easier and better. Getting out of poverty makes life easier and better. There are certain certain things that get you above just trying to survive that will make your life easier and better. But remember, we're not talking about that with dreams usually. We're talking about things that are a little bit bigger, a little bit beyond that. Your life won't be easier and better. You'll still have challenges. You'll still have problems. You've heard that from everyone here tonight. And I, I could give all my own problems as well. They will just change flavor. They will be slightly different. Okay. It's not useful to pursue a dream because then everyone will like you and you'll impress everyone. Some people won't like it. Some people will judge you even. We're going to talk about that more in a minute. And finally, I don't want you pursuing a dream in order to try to finally approve of yourself. Okay. So there are two reasons I think are the best, most healthy, useful reasons to pursue a dream. And they are this. I'm going to put them really simply on the screen for you here. Two reasons. Number one, growth. And number two, to lift others. Okay. So we are here on earth to grow. That is why we are here. We are not just here to return to our Heavenly Father. If that were the case, why would He send us away in the first place? We are here to grow. We are here to become like our Heavenly Father and our Heavenly Mother. 
We are here to become like them. And I'm going to talk more about that in just a minute. I want to talk about lifting others though first. Lifting others is something that at our core, we all want to do. This is why when you have a dream, like I'm a life coach, so I work with a lot of clients who find huge transformations in their life through coaching. And then many of them go on to say, I kind of want to be a life coach. It, it creates a dream, right? They think I don't need to be a life coach to survive. In fact, there's a lot of easier ways to make a living if that's what I'm trying to do. But I kind of want to because I want to help people the way I was helped right? That's what we do. We, we figure something out. We solve it or we get through a, a trial and then we want to use our experience to go help others going through some other similar kind of trial. Okay. So anything that you have a dream of doing is going to help people. Maybe it's not directly helping in that way. Maybe you want to be an artist. Maybe you want to, um, again, uh, entertain, maybe you want to climb a mountain, you're still lifting people through your dream because you're at the very least you're inspiring people. Okay. You might be, you might be leading, entertaining, serving, but at the very least you're inspiring people and that we are created in the image of our heavenly parents. We are wired to help lift one another. Okay. So if your dream is to um, make knock off Instagram accounts and try to steal money from people through fake Bitcoin direct messages, then you have a different problem. You don't have a dream, right? And I'm guessing that's nobody on this, on this uh, fireside. So let's go back to growth. I want to talk to you about why dreams are scary. Why it doesn't even require courage. Why wouldn't we want to run towards it if it's our dream? Why is it scary and how that contributes to our growth? Okay. So Number one reason a dream can be scary is because we have a fear of failure. We fear failure, right? But here's what I want to tell you. Failure and success are not separate. Failure and success go together. Okay? So let's just talk about how do we fail. And, and, and as I say that, failure and ses- success go together. I hope that you're not like, what? Nobody ever told me that before. <laughs> you probably have heard that before. You're probably well aware of that. You know that everyone, basically everyone, pretty much everyone who's ever succeeded at anything had to fail at it a lot of times first. Okay. So how do we minimize our fear of failure a little bit? Okay. People who succeed think of failure the way a scientist works in a lab, okay? When they go out and they try things and they put themselves out in the world and they attempt things and they fail, as we all will, they don't make it dramatic. They make it more like math or science, okay? Think about a scientist in a lab trying to, let's say, uh, find a, a cure for some disease. They test something. Oh, it didn't work. Let's try again. Let's test something else. Oh, that didn't work. Let's try again. What we tend to do when we're not thinking like a scientist is we make it all dramatic, right? I'm never going to get there. Who do I think I am? Why did I try this in the first place? What's everyone going to think of me? Whatever your drama thoughts are, those are what mine sound like, okay? So you have to choose to think like a scientist and go, that didn't work. Let's try again. That didn't work. Let's try again and cut out the drama. Um, I had this dream for many, many years to speak at Time Out for Women. If you're familiar, probably a lot of you are familiar with Time Out for Women. It's a conference put on by Deseret Book. And um, it, it's it's got amazing speakers and music. And I, I wanted, I've been going to Time Out for Women for years, and I decided it would be cool to speak there to share my message as a life coach. Okay. In order to speak at Time Out for Women, you have to have a book or a or music or something published through Deseret Book. Okay. They're the ones that put on the conference. And at one point, an editor from Desert Book reached out to me and said, have you ever thought of writing a book? I'd love to work with you. I worked with this editor for over a year, year and a half, um, writing a book. She helped me. I it went back and forth. Long process for some of us, <laughs> writing a book, right? Apparently not for Gaina Lynn. It's maybe easier. But for me, it's, it's a hard process, right? So we went back and forth. We, we had this amazing book at the end. And then Desert Book said, we just don't think that we're the right fit to publish your book. Now, my brain wants to go to drama. Who do you think you are, Jody Moore? Why did you have that dream of speaking at Time Out for Women or writing a book? Why did you ever, like all the noise, right? How embarrassing. What are people going to say? What are people going to think? All of that. Um, 
but we don't have to. And it, it's okay to be disappointed. Please don't hear me say that you should think positively about anything, about everything that happens in life. That's not what I'm saying at all. Disappointment, natural. Even having intense emotions is normal and healthy. There's a grieving process sometimes that comes when your dream doesn't come to fruition the way you thought it would. Okay. So I went through a period of being mad and sad and confused and overwhelmed and all of that when um, my dream didn't look like it was going to happen the way I thought it would. Okay. You have to allow those emotions, but so many of us don't pursue our dreams because we don't want to do that part. We don't want to have that experience. And here's what I want to tell you. If you allow the experience, you allow yourself to grieve it, then you can move into scientist mode and go, okay, well, I thought I was going to speak at Time Out for Women with this book, but I guess not. And you don't even have to quit on your dream. I decided, I guess I'm going to speak there a different way. I don't know what that's going to be but it's not going to be this book. Maybe it's another book. Maybe who knows what it'll be, right? You can move into scientist mode when you're ready. And what is the alternative? The alternative, if I decide I'm not going to go pursue my dream because I'm afraid of failing, the alternative isn't better. It isn't peace. It's just failing ahead of time, right? Think about it. Imagine your teenage son comes to you and says, I want to try out for the basketball team, but I'm afraid I won't make it on the basketball team. And that will be disappointing. So I'm not going to try out. He's failing ahead of time. He's just for sure not going to get onto the basketball team, right? By not trying out. So I like to remind myself, I'm not going to fail ahead of time. I'm willing to feel emotions. And I know I can move into scientist mode when I'm ready. And the scriptures tell us that the Lord will make our weaknesses our strengths, that he, he can do that. How does that happen? Do you think that happens by us sitting home magically or even praying? No, we have to go try things and fail at it. That is how he helps mold our weaknesses into strengths. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the second reason we're afraid to pursue our dreams. And this one is we're afraid of what other people will think. I hear this come up over and over again when I'm coaching clients on whatever their dream are, is they're afraid to try. They're afraid of what people will think. We're afraid that people will judge us. We're afraid that people will laugh at us. We're afraid that people will talk badly about us behind our backs and make fun of us. And guess what? Some people may. Some people may, but not most people, actually. Most people are very supportive of people pursuing dreams, but but there might be a few, okay? And here's what I want to tell you. I, I coached a client just, just yesterday, actually. She is very high up in her company. She's very successful. She does really well. It has a great reputation. And she's leaving that company to start her own coaching practice. She's become a coach. And she's afraid. She needs to put videos out. She needs to start publishing content on YouTube or Instagram or somewhere, right? And she's afraid to do it because she's worried people will laugh at her. So the first thing you want to do is answer who. Who am I afraid? Specifically, I I made her give me a specific name. She gave me the name of somebody in her company and we'll just call her Julia. Okay. She's like, Julia, she might see my video and she'll laugh at me and go, what is she doing leaving this great position and trying to start this business? Who does she think she is? And we said, okay, but is Julia your client? Is she the reason you're becoming a life coach? Is she the person you want to help? And my client was like, no, I mean, she, she could benefit from my help, but she's not. She's not my target client. She's not the person I want to help, right? When I say we want to help people, she's not the one that in my heart, I'm like, I could help this person. And so I said, okay, so can we just let Julia, if she even pays attention or cares, can we just let a few Julias laugh at us in the name of all the people that want our help or all the people we could inspire? Okay, so listen. The scriptures remind us of this over and over again. The Lord looketh on the heart, right? Uh, human beings, we're not, we're not always good at looking on the heart. Sometimes we judge one another. We're all guilty of it. But the Lord looks on our heart. And that's the only opinion that matters, right? So I like to have it, some go-to thoughts when my head gets afraid of other people's judgment, like what other people think of me is none of my business. And I'm pursuing this dream because it's my dream, but also because I want to help people. And it's, this is about them. It's not about me. So you can have some ways to kind of overcome that. Okay. The third and final 
reason I think, well, there can be a lot of reasons, but the third most common reason I see that we're afraid to pursue our dreams is because of our own judgment of ourselves. We judge ourselves, right? Which is why when you work on number one and number two, when you work on being willing to fail and not making it mean something of terrible about you and being okay with other people having a, a opinion, like you can just give other people permission to judge you, right? When you do those two things, this one gets a lot easier, but it might still be there because we tend to be our own worst critics, right? So what I want you to think about is when you go to pursue your dream, you have to be a loving mentor or boss or supervisor to yourself. Okay. What does a loving supervisor or leader or boss or mentor do? That when you really try, but you fail, they don't go, well, you're a loser. I don't know why you thought you could do this in the first place, right? They go, you know what? Amazing job today. That was great effort. I'm so glad you tried. We'll get it next time. Let's go again right? You need your own compassion then. What about when you don't show up and try? What does a good loving mentor or boss or leader do? They don't go, oh, well, forget it. Like we tend to do, right? Oh, well, maybe I'm just not going to do this. They go, hey, what's going on? I thought this is important to you. I know you can do this. I want to help you. What do you need? Let's go. Let's, they, they hold you accountable too, right? In a loving way. So you got to be kind to yourself the way anyone leading you, because you've got to lead yourself sometimes through your dream, would lead you. It is your job to believe in you, right? I love what Gaina Lynn said about um, the Lord wants joy for us. He wants good things for us. But he already believes in you. But guess what? Maybe your former coworker, maybe your spouse, maybe your, your mother or father isn't able to believe in you. You got to believe in you and, and turn to the Lord and ask him the, to help you see yourself the way he does. Okay. Um, the Lord's plan is better than my plan. I, again, such good examples of this from the other speakers we've had tonight. But when Portia was telling her story, I kept thinking, yes, that it's a powerful example of how I think my plan is the best plan. We should just go with it. But it doesn't usually work that way when we pursue a dream. It's the Lord's plan. It's his timing. It's his methodology. And as you pursue a dream, if you can overcome these challenges, if you can manage your way through them anyway, I don't think I've never been able to get rid of the fear. I've just been able to have enough courage to move forward anyway by managing myself by choosing how I'm going to think about it, by allowing the Lord to strengthen me th through that strengthening power of the atonement. So I, um, I ended up publishing that an amazing book that um, an, an awesome editor at Desert Book helped me to write. I was able to take to Faith Matters and publish with them. I don't know if you know Faith Matters, but that was a perfect fit for my book. And it was such an amazing experience. And I met some amazing people that have changed my life. And so now I can see like, of course, my book was supposed to not get published at Deseret Book. It was supposed to be published at Faith Matters. And a few months after my book came out, I got an email from someone at Deseret Book saying, we are starting a new community for women called Magnify. And we'd love for you to participate in this community and, and do some work with us in it. And we're going to be promoting that Magnify community at Time Out for Women. And we were hoping you will come and speak this year at Time Out for Women. Man, that was a lesson for me that the Lord's plan is better than my plan. And that my dreams, pursuing them, is going to require some failure along the way. Sometimes it's a couple big failures. Sometimes it's a whole bunch of little failures, but failure is the way that the Lord strengthens us. And I'm so glad that I chose to, after I processed the emotion of that disappointment, to maintain a healthy, good relationship with Deseret Book and not sit around and be mad about it, right? I could have done that. I've done that in other areas of my life. And the Lord can't guide me through my dreams if I don't choose to come back to a Christ-like place. But if I do, he will in miraculous ways. I've seen that happen for myself, so many of my clients, and I know that's possible for you too, my friend. So last thing I want to leave you with is this, um, in the scriptures, I want to share with you this picture of Christ. I love this picture. And in the scriptures, it says, ask and ye shall receive, 
knock and it shall be opened unto you. And I love the idea. We, we hear this a lot, like with the Joseph Smith story, right? That if we ask the Lord, can you tell me if the church is true or what have you, that he will tell us. But what about the knocking part? He wants us to take action. He wants us to go try things. He wants us to try out for the sports team. He wants us to pursue the business or the whatever it is that is your dream. You have to knock and it will be opened unto you. Maybe not the first time. Maybe you're going to have to knock a whole bunch of times, but can you overcome, not overcome, but manage yourself through it? Can you choose to come back to a Christ-like place and to keep trying? And it's my testimony that if you do, that the Lord will help you um, achieve any righteous dream that you have. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. trying to click the right buttons uh jody that and and trying to finish my own notes <laughs> that the so that, that was just wonderful and i love how there at the end you talked about how you must knock like it's really easy to pray for things and if we're not doing anything to actually accomplish it then how can we expect heavenly father to open up doors if we're not even out knocking on them we're not trying to figure out how to make it work we're not uh, making mistakes and learning from our mistakes and, and what everything. And, um, and I also loved how you talked about what's the alternative, you know, it's the alternative. If we don't go after the things that are important to us, then we have created the thing that we fear in the first place. And so our only real chance of, of not having that result is to try. And I thought that that yeah, was a huge you. reframe. Thank you so much. Well, and I think that little, sorry, really quickly, that little voice in us too that wants to try things so that we can grow keeps eating away at you. So rather than the pain of failure, it's like a slow, dull pain of what you're not pursuing. Totally. Jody, I loved that you said it's your job to believe in yourself so much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to just take that and run with it because I think what has changed so much for me is that I care most about how I feel about myself. Like when I look in the mirror, I need to feel good about that person. And it's, it's helped me put things into perspective, those social media comments or what other people have to say. It's like, am I right with my integrity with myself and with my father in heaven? And I love that you said, you know, success and failure go together. Because I think that if we think it's going to be a smooth trip, we're going to learn so much in the failure. There's just so much growth and learning in the failure. And so thank you for that. Um, I also like that when you don't try, you're just failing ahead of time. You know, those are just really important <laughs> lessons for me. Like not trying is just failing ahead of time. I mean, either you know, you're going to fail and learn or you're going to fail ahead of time and you're yeah. not going to learn you don't get the growth. So yeah. um, I love that. So, so amazing. Thank you. I, I love that we get to identify the voices in our head and how we talked about ourselves. And just to clarify, Jody, it is a very painful process for me to write. So my 13. <laughs> okay, <was> good. <laughs> you. <laughs> you That's just been through it a lot of times. <laughs> oh yeah. And we could have, we could have a private conversation on, <laughs> on another time about the backstories of everything. So, you know, I mean, I think it's just, I think there's, I, I wrote, um, you're more than enough. You are magnificent. And one of the negative reviewers of that book, um, said I had a lot of positive reviews and it won best of state, but one of the negative reviewers was like, well, there's no hope for me if Gaina Lynn feels like she's not enough. And I thought, oh my gosh, if you don't understand that we all walk around with that voice in our head. Yeah then you don't know a lot of people that quote unquote look like they're succeeding in their, in their yeah. space. And so I just think, you know, I know some of the most famous, well-known people, some of them are my dear friends and their voices in their head sound just as critical as maybe the, the everyday person that you see walking around. So I love that okay. you kind of deconstructed that idea of pulling that voice out of our heads and really identifying who is that voice? What is that voice? Who is that person? Mm -hmm. And is there truth there? So yeah. Yeah. yeah that voice right. in my head. The only reason I wrote that book is because that voice in my head is loud every day and I get to check it every day. So <laughs> that's right. Every day. 
It's, oh, it's planning a party right now in the garage. So as soon as we're, <laughs> we're done with this fireside, we're going to have a little come to Jesus because I think they're in the garage re ready to hang out. So. Oh, man. <laughs> Makes me think of uh, it makes me think of a, a conference that I was at once, business conference, and this guy has done really well for himself, small beginnings, and now runs a multi, multi, multi million dollar business. And it was the first live event that he'd ever put on. And in one of the sessions, he says he asked if he could be honest with us and said, you know, up until the point where I came out on stage, I was sure that nobody was going to show up. Yeah. I was terrified that nobody was going to show up. And yeah. there were five or 600 people that had all come from around the country to learn from him. And, yeah. and he, he talked about, he just, he's like, I need you to understand that that voice that creates doubt in your mind, it never goes away. That's you have right. to learn how to, to manage those emotions. Like you said, Jody, otherwise okay. you're, cause you're always going to struggle with it. It, it might get easier to manage it over time as you learn tools and tactics and everything, but it's never going to go away. So, cause that's just well, part of the human and, condition. And I would just say that's the gift of like both Jody and Portia and Mark, because we know each other. Um, that's our offering as well. I would just say that that's the place of empathy that I get to go to. Like I, that's the place I try to write books from and speak at firesides about and go on TV and talk about. And like, I try to really stay connected so that that voice isn't um, telling me to be quiet, but actually allowing me to connect with that voice in somebody else in a way that feels like empathy versus sympathy, right? Instead of just, mm -hmm. I'm on this side of the fence saying, oh, I'm so sorry you're going through that. And we really join each other in that humanness. Mm -hmm. um, that I think is the beautiful gift we each can bring. But if we like Portia taught, hide that. I, I just think yeah. how many, how many unwritten books or un- um, unstarted, I don't think that's the right word. This is why I have an editor, uh, businesses <laughs> because someone was like, oh my gosh, I don't have all the boxes checked. And if anyone really knew who I was and I'm thinking like the offering is from that raw place is from that vulnerable place is from that mm. place that the voice is really loud in my head, you know? Yeah, that's right. That's right. I love that. Well, Jody, thank you so much again for your thoughts and perspective. That was so powerful. And thank you to all three of you. This has been, I've taken so many notes through all three of your presentations today. And I'm so excited for just the future. This is such a great, I mean, glad that I'm glad that we're doing this, uh, you know, in January so that we can, we can make the rest of the year uh, good. No, not good. Great. <laughs> <laughs> No matter how it amazing. turns out, you know, it's going to be amazing. It's, it's going to be amazing. And, you know, it's like we either, we either, uh, what's the phrase you, you either learn or you, you either win or you learn, you know, and either way is you, you win. So thank you all so much again for being with us here on the fireside. And with that, I think we'll finish with a closing prayer and then get, it's a Sunday night. So it's a perfect time for a little bit of goal setting, especially here in January. So we'll uh, finish with a closing prayer and to all of you who wherever you are throughout the world. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another Digital Fireside. And uh, that prayer will be by Ganelin. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the feelings that we've had, the learnings that we've experienced and the promptings. Heavenly Father, we ask that thou might bless us with more courage and faith as we go forward in this new year. Help us to find healing and grace and help us to find steps forward sometimes in the dark, help us to really understand and know in our soul of our worth with thee and how thou seest us. Help us to trust that thou wants for us all good things and bless us as we go forward this year that, that we will continue to seek and expect miracles. And we say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.